Digital Marketing Radio, episode 222, honing the customer buying process. DigitalMarketingRadio.com Broadcasting live on the Digital Marketing Radio Facebook page, this is the weekly show that prizes actionable advice from today's top digital marketers. Catch up with all the latest episodes at DigitalMarketingRadio.com The Big Interview with David Bain Hello, hello, I'm David Bain, and uh, today I am joined by the first woman to sell machine shop tools in the USA. And since then, she's been learning every, everything she could about tech and selling. Welcome to DMR, Kristen Chivago. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, you can find Kristen over at zhivagopartners.com. And I will, of course, link to that in the show notes at digitalmarketingradio.com. So, um... Kristen, today we're talking about uh, the customer buying process and um, what aspects would you say of that would you say that, that most businesses are, are struggling with a bit at the moment? Golly, yeah. <laughs> that's a big question. Okay, so I think the biggest problem is that it's all moving so fast. <clears throat> Sorry, and you have to really be up to date on what's happening with your marketplace and uh, the technology both. Uh, not to mention internal politics and trends in your market and a lot of other things. So it's really gotten so fast moving. Uh, and not to mention that that uh, the customers have changed the way they buy pretty drastically over the last two years. I mean, really drastically. And then now we have Google. Google's our other customer. We don't if we don't appeal to Google. We're invisible to our customers, and that has been the whole search engine optimization thing has been kind of a black art that people don't want anybody to understand because they want to get paid for it. Um, so there's a lot of um, uh, indecision there and uh, people are sort of nervous about what, what actually works for SEO. So part of what I do is try to demystify that. You said specifically two years. Is that because of the advent of mobile and people really using smartphones instead of desktop or some other reason? Yeah, I don't know why it's happening so quickly now, but it definitely mobile has been a factor. So there is obviously the trend of things like um, shoes near me or clothes near me or food near me, although now Google's starting to say that people are not typing in near me because, uh, and that's just been a, a, a recent change, because they assume that Google knows where they are, and so they don't even need to say near me, and usually they're right, especially mm. when they're on their mobile phone and they're being tracked. So uh, that alone, just the idea that you can be standing in a city somewhere and find a good place to eat and actually read reviews <laughs> while you're standing there, or stand inside Walmart, which I did recently buying something, and I, you know there were four or five options in front of me, and... I really wanted to see which one was was better reviewed and so I stood there with my iPhone and read the reviews and what people said about well this is good but watch out for that you know I, th I so, thought you were going to say you were going to see if you could get it any cheaper anywhere else on your phone No no I was in a hurry <laughs> <laughs> I was getting a cooking pot for a party kind of thing a family gathering and I I no I wasn't going to be shopping around <laughs> So, um, obviously, uh, I'm intrigued by, you know, you're saying that change, things have changed so much over the last couple of years. Um, is, is, uh, is it just consumer behavior completely that has changed? And do you think businesses as a whole, perhaps certainly physical businesses, as you're talking about, haven't caught up with that yet? Yes. In, an, in a word, yes, that is the problem. And, and the other problem is they never were businesses even before all this massive change, never were that um, in tune with what buyers really wanted anyway. And the reason I know that is because I was a revenue coach for decades and uh, would always interview my customers first, my clients, and they would say, these are the things that are important to customers. And then I'd go out and interview their customers and find out their list was completely different. Right, okay. So should all digital marketers be interviewing customers as well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you too many yes, questions that are simply yes no, or no, no answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, well, they're good questions, but yes, absolutely. If you are not, you are quickly going to be uh, off the train. I mean, they're going to be in a completely different track. And, uh, you know, this is sad. Um, 
inside companies, we, we sort of develop myths. We develop personas. We develop strategies. We have all these ideas about what we think our customers are thinking. And we're usually wrong. It's a very sad fact. So even when people talk about developing personas, I, I just shrug my shoulders and say, well, you're guessing and you're probably wrong. And it isn't so much deciding who they are, what they care about. It's, it's how they want to buy and what they're thinking about while they're buying. That's the real issue. And nobody does that. They don't dissect the buying process to the point where you really do answer all of their questions. And I'll just say one more thing about that. When you're a buyer and you go to buy something and, and the manufacturer doesn't even list the physical characteristics like it's this high and this wide and this deep mm. on Amazon and customers have to answer that question for each other, yeah. that's when you realize how far off we are. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great tip. So look into competitors' goods and see frequently asked questions there and just make sure you answer everything before your customers or potential customers get frustrated and then don't end up purchasing from you. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously businesses need to be doing a lot more face-to-face -face by the sound of it. So should this, these conversations with, with customers um, be happening on an ongoing basis or is this something you advocate maybe just once every six months or something like that? Depends on how fast your market's moving. And by the way, I don't advocate face-to-face. -face. People will tell you much less face-to-face -face than they will on the phone. So you use email, you, you actually, in my book, chapter three, I give you every single detail about how to get somebody on the phone, how long to keep them, what questions to ask, um, all of the interviewing techniques, the email you send them and all that. So there is a way to do it. You get people on the phone, they're comfortable, you ask open-ended questions, they talk for a long time, they're excited that somebody asked them. They have already bought from you, so they have a vested interest in your success and they're much more likely to talk to you. Um, so that's the method. And once you ask those questions, you're going to start seeing trends and you're going to start to reverse engineer the buying process and be able to start answering the questions they had. You know, you can say, what were you trying to find out and how easy was it while you were trying to buy from us? So what are the worst assumptions that you see businesses making um, when presuming what their customers are looking for and not actually talking to them? Uh, one of the things that happens, especially, and I've done a lot of work in the tech industry for many decades, and what I always found was that the, the developers of the product were very excited about a particular aspect of the product because it was so hard for them to do. And competitively, they were really excited. that They did it more elegantly than anyone else. Then you go out and you interview customers and you find out, they say, oh, well, yeah, but everybody does that. And they just consider it what I call an industry baseline promise, like boats have to float and airplanes fly and food doesn't poison you. And so they, they just dismiss it. And it's not the thing that the one thing that's going to make them buy, like I enter this data once and it populates everywhere else in the program. That's really important to me. Or it's super easy to integrate this with the other things that I already have in my environment. That kind of thing companies think of as, um, uh, sort of side issues that aren't really that important to them because they just assume everybody's doing it or it's not that hard to do or they, they don't think it's that hard. Whereas the customer has a lot of trouble with that. In the physical world, like the consumer world, I noticed that they leave off um, particular details, again, like the physical measurements. And let's say that you're going to buy a particular piece of equipment uh, electronic equipment it has to fit in a certain space hmm. nobody even thinks about that you know um, so the things that they think about as the, the the seller as the manufacturer as the producer are very different things than people think about when they're buying so in traditional sales you focus on features and benefits and it sounds like from what you're saying features are perhaps more important for online selling or is that not correct? Well, I actually don't like features and benefits because it got us into this mood where we sort of said, well, here's this thing and here's what it does for you. It's more about the function. When a customer is going to buy something, they're going to use it. 
And one of the biggest questions I think people should answer is what's going to happen to me after I buy? What if it breaks? Do you, can I return it easily? What if I need support? How do I get that? Is there somebody available, you know, on chat or whatever? How are you going to treat me after I buy this? And how am I going to use this effectively? And that's where most people fall down. They don't tell you, okay, let's assume you say yes. Now, this is what you need to know. Here's what you're going to do. One of the things that was really interesting to me is that uh, as I was interviewing technical buyers, I would find that they would often go to the technical manual first before they'd even spend any time at all reading the features and benefits yeah. on the website because they figured that the technical manual was going to then explain to them what's going to happen to me after I buy. So that's one of the areas where people are really not doing a good job. Now, obviously, uh, Google Analytics, Google Trends, Google wants you to be successful with your AdWords and your and your search engine optimization. So you can find out a lot of things about how people search, but why they're buying and why they're typing in those search engine terms also has to be part of what you're doing. These are human beings. They're not personas. They're not robots. They're real people with very specific, weird, idiosyncratic kinds of things. And you need to know what they are in order to sell. Great. Okay. And at the top of the episode, you mentioned that um, SEO is changing and very important. You've also talked a lot about establishing the, the content that you need to be mentioning. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, what, how you actually determine the content that you need to produce uh, and where you should actually publish it? Should it be on the buying page or, or should it be elsewhere? Well, okay, so SEO is really complex, again, but I've been trying to figure out how to simplify it for people so it's easier for them to think about and implement. Um, first of all, remember that Google is a robot, so Google needs structure. Google is like a machine who needs structure. And the first place we always start is with what I call now the SEO persona, not customer persona, but your persona as a company being viewed by Google. Google needs a two by four over the head. Google is a very smart robot, but Google is still a robot, stupid robot. So you have to say, all right, here's my company name. Here are the three things I'm really good at. Here are the things I'm associated with uh, and the things that we do really well. You, so you, ident you, you identify these, these phrases and terms that uh, apply to you as a company and your products. And then you look at the keywords that people would use to find you. So you develop this persona and then you say, all right, what are all the key phrases? So that's one part of it. Another part of it is Google needs proof. So Google wants to see who else is linking to you. So you have to have directories, you have to have backlinks, you have to say to Google, our site's important and people are coming here. So Google looks at traffic, obviously, and bounce rates and all of that sort of thing. There's about 200 criteria that Google looks at and they change their algorithm twice a day. So, you know, you can't be too in the weeds. You just have to get the basics right. Um, you do need to work on social because social is a link back to your site uh, and Google pays attention to that. Um, but otherwise, of course, you're doing fresh content in your blog and new pages that relate to a specific term or phrase that's part of your SEO persona. And you keep hitting those topics over and over again. It's a long term process. It, there's nothing overnight about search engine optimization. So is content publishing right for every single type of business? Uh, mm. That's a tough question to answer. I, I'd be really afraid to say absolutely 100% because you might be selling something that's, uh, in my book I talk about light scrutiny, medium scrutiny, heavy and intense scrutiny products and services. And all products and services fall into one of those categories. Um, if you're selling a light scrutiny product like the equivalent of chewing gum, you don't need to write an article every week about how to chew gum. Okay. Now, 
look at Joan Soda and people like that who kind of made a whole branding thing about soda and everything around soda and the community about soda. They've been around a long time now, but they really were a good example of somebody who took it beyond the soda. So yes, you could do that. Um, but you really have to think about what do people need in order to buy? And that's the first place you need to start with marketing. The problem is everybody starts with the vehicle. They say, oh, we have to do social, we have to do content, we have to do blog pages, we have, to... wait a minute, what are customers trying to do when they go to buy? Where do they expect to see you? How do they expect you to answer their questions? Where are they going to get that data? That's where you need to start. Right, okay. So are you seeing too many businesses just trying to do the marketing activities that are fun rather than actually focusing on the areas that <laughs> move the needle? Yeah, that's definitely a good way of saying it. And fun and easy. I mean, it's much more fun to do social or Facebook than it is uh, or Instagram or whatever. Um, but let's say you're a B2B company that develops software for other companies. Instagram isn't going to help you. Pinterest is not going to help you. On the other hand, if you're a jewelry store, um, Instagram can be the way you sell most of your products. So you really have to understand where your customers are and the vehicles they're using, which is why if you have customers, you need to go back to those customers and say, where would you expect to find us? What would be most helpful to you in your buying process? What, if it, what would have made it easier for you to find us and buy from us? I'd also like to get a few thoughts from you on integrating sales and marketing together better and perhaps a few mistakes that businesses are doing at the moment and how they can overcome that. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I'm laughing because I've been talking about that problem. I've been writing about marketing since, oh golly, 1984, I think, was when I started writing in, in magazines about, back then we wrote in magazines. Um, and I've been writing about cats and dogs. Marketers are cats and and salespeople are dogs. And now we have new kinds of marketers which are really digital cats. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that because the salespeople and the marketers don't communicate well about that buying process, and because the marketers don't spend enough time talking to customers, they don't have the respect of the salespeople who talk to customers all day long. But you can't rely on what the salespeople hear from customers because while you're being sold to, you don't tell salespeople what you're thinking. Nobody ever tells a salesperson what they're really thinking while they're being sold to because they're playing poker. It's a negotiation. So um, that right there, automatically, now you're in trouble. You've got two groups of people with two different perceptions trying to talk a similar language, and it doesn't work. I will say that technology is slowly starting to solve this problem because you have your CRM systems, you've got your lead systems. Uh, we're working with a company called Lead Forensics that says, okay, here are the companies that came to your site and here are the possible people there were that, that did that. And now call them within a few minutes and you know, put them in your CRM. And so it immediately feeds sales into marketing. So I'm starting to see technology solve the problem that, politics never would solve. Okay, yes. Well, I'm sure it has been a challenge for many years and it will be interesting to see how technology continues to evolve and um, how eager certain salespeople are to embrace that technology because I, I guess some salespeople are a little bit more traditional and comfortable oh, yeah. at being face-to-face -face rather than embracing technology themselves. But, yeah, um, we have salespeople that aren't comfortable with technology and they're on their way out. I mean, that's that's just happening everywhere. Right now, if you're not running full force into technology 24-7, you're falling behind. So you've seen some massive changes then just over the last couple of years. Are there some more different massive changes coming along over the next couple of years, do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, who knows? We might all be chipped. <laughs> you know, in a, in a couple of years and you just walk into the store, like I think Amazon has those stores where you just walk in and you don't even have to check out. They, you know, they're tracking you and seeing what you pick up and put in your cart and then you're done. Hmm. Um, the whole idea of money has gone away. I mean, uh, we who, who, 
I was trying to tip somebody the other day. I was like, couldn't do it because I don't have any cash on me anymore. I mean, you know, who carries cash? So just in the last 20 years and even in the last two because of mobile and Google uh, applying itself to mobile and, and getting on board with mobile, I think that's been the major change and the whole cashless society and how easy it is to buy something without going through all of that, you know, um, and we will get to the point where we all have these little digital wallets and we just walk in and walk out or we span, scan our fingerprint or something. Those days are coming. There's no question about it. So how is that going to change the buying process? Might you walk up to a product and swipe your thing and then be able to listen or maybe even ask a question of a candy bar standing in a store and say, what, wait, you don't say how many fat calories this has. I want to know. And somebody on chat comes on into your head and says, oh, thank you, Mary. I know you're standing in, you know, McQuaid's Market in Jamestown, Rhode Island, and you want to know the answer, and here it is. I mean, those days are coming. That's that's where it's all going. Yes, no, great thoughts. It's, um, it's all changing, and you've got to um, be on top of that. Um, so... In a moment, we're going to be moving to the second part of a conversation, so I'll be uh, asking Kirsten about... I, I'll say that again. I, 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 I mispronounced your name again, so I'm going to... No, I'm sorry. Right. Apologi you got the last name, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, apologies about it's that, fine. yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'll say it again so I can get it correct when I edit this into the final better uh, audio <laughs> version. So, um, No worries. In a moment, we're going to move into the second part of our discussion. We'll be... Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> I can't get my teeth in now. In a moment, I'm going to be moving to the second part of our conversation where I will be asking Kristen about the software that she couldn't live without. But first of all, um, I would actually uh, like you, Kristen, just to tell the listener your book because um, you've been referring to that a little bit and I'm sure people will want to know precisely what title it is. So uh, what's that? Uh, the book is called Roadmap to Revenue, How to Sell the Way Your Customers Want to Buy. And as I mentioned, it does talk about the interviewing process. Um, and it also takes the whole buying process. I was one of the first people to take sales and convert it and look at it from the standpoint of the buying process. So it looks at those four categories of products and says, here is the buying process for those categories. And if you know that and you understand the questions that people ask and the best way to answer them, you'll be able to um, sell more effectively. That's what the book's about. Wonderful. And I'll also include a link to that in the, sh in the show notes at digitalmarketingradio.com. Good, thanks. Um, but um, I will also tell the listener about Digital Marketing in 2017. And that's my book. And that's um, where I interviewed 107 digital marketers on their thoughts on the number one digital marketing strategy for 2017. So you can get that one at the uh, URL digitalmarketingin2017.com. But let us segue over to the second part of our conversation. So um, that focuses on Kristen thoughts on where digital marketing's been and where it's heading. So starting off with digitalmarketingradio.com. <laughs> starting off with software I couldn't live without. So Kristen, what software do you currently use in your business that if someone took away from you, it would significantly impact your marketing success? Oh, golly, that's a good question. Um, well, I have fallen in love with a couple of things lately. Uh, one of them is teamwork.com. Okay. Uh, we're using that for project management now. And I have to say I have tried, probably seriously tried, about 25 different uh, project management systems and probably looked at at least 50 and never been satisfied. Always just said, never mind, they don't get it. It's too complex or it's not. it's just not the right level of management. Uh, teamwork has been phenomenal. I'm able to give clients their own portals. Um, we can drill down. I can very quickly give someone a task and follow them through. You can have milestones. There's calendars. There's reminders. I mean, it's everything you need, but it's it doesn't get in the way. I, I noticed with Basecamp, and no offense to Basecamp, I know it's very popular, but there's just so much graphic uh, stuff on the screen that kind of gets in the way. And this one's very clean and very straightforward. It's really beautiful software. It's one of the best programs I've seen in all my decades of being in tech. Well, great recommendation. And I don't think anyone has recommended it before, so that's even better. But you gave that answer a little bit too easily, so I'm going to ask you an even more challenging question. And that okay. is, what piece of software don't you use, but you've heard good things about and you intend to try at some point in the near future? Uh, 
uh, well, if I don't if I don't try it right away and I don't like it, I don't I don't buy it. And now, okay, so there's Salesforce. Um, of course, everybody talks about it. Big deal. I have. I don't recommend Salesforce for anybody who doesn't have a programmer in their back pocket. It's a tough, really tough uh, program to use and very complex. Now, for some companies, it's appropriate and people do use it. Um, and obviously, they've been very successful uh, and good for them. But if you just need, I find that smaller companies say, oh, well, I have to go to Salesforce. No, you don't. There's a lot of great CRM systems out there that do integrate with marketing automation programs that are just fine. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Zapier as well. And um, that integrates about 700 different software programs, including multiple different CRM systems as well. So you're bound to find something that you like in there that can integrate with your, your marketing automation. And integration is key, certainly. You have to have your software talking to each other. Oh, yeah. Let us move on to... I wish I would have. So I'd like you to look back on the very first day that you're involved in trying to market a business online. So what didn't you do so well? What do you wish that you would have done differently? I think part of the, the issue these days is, is because we can do everything with technology, we think we should do everything. So it's kind of a constant battle to make sure that you are delegating appropriately to people who are perfectly capable of doing those tasks with the software. And especially true when you're an entrepreneur or a small business, it's so tempting to just try to do everything yourself. So it, I'm always asking myself, could somebody else do this right now? And how quickly can I get them to do it? How, you know, who could do it and, and how quickly? And I, I'm really running my business that way now. So I have a lot of virtual assistants and people all over the world that help keep things running and have tasks and certain types of tasks associated uh, or assigned to them. And I do find that once they get going, they're actually better at it than I would have been anyway. So it's, it's really, uh, you know, the idea of delegating is super important right now. I'm going to take a slight tangent here and ask you, do you think that um, the majority of businesses in the future will have most of their staff on an outsource basis? Uh, well, let's put it this way. That's definitely increasing. And, you know, I was thinking the other day when, when I'm using these tools that, that uh, align you with freelancers all over the world, I was thinking to myself, there's absolutely no excuse for poverty anymore. Really, if you're willing to learn, you can learn anything you want. If you have access to the internet, you can look at Google and learn anything, or YouTube, and learn anything you want to learn and get good at things and be curious and sort of specialize in an area. And then you put yourself up on one of these, these places uh, that say, okay, here I am. Here are my skills. Here's my resume. Here are the other people that have used me in my reviews. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. And then give me a try. Here's my hourly rate. Oh, yes. Uh, did I tell you I was in Bangladesh? Okay. You know, fine. I mean, yeah. uh, so it, it's really, there's no excuse anymore for, for poverty. I think we're actually getting out of that whole terrible poverty kind of uh, mindset. I think, I think people are going to be employable wherever they are. Yeah, that's a great positive view of the future as well. So thank you for that. We're Good. recording this. Um, uh, we're recording this live on Facebook, of course, and um, there's a couple of nice comments there. Um, Sampath, hi, David, and we've got um, Serverlift Corporation saying Kristen's the best. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of our clients. That's very nice. I'm glad they're listening. That's cool. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Okay, well, let's move on to the this or that round. And um, this is a quick response round. So ten quick questions, just two rows here. Try not to think about the answer too much, and you're only allowed to say the word both on one occasion. So use it wisely. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Twitter or Snapchat? Twitter. Facebook or LinkedIn? LinkedIn for B2B, Facebook for consumer. YouTube or Facebook Live? I'd say YouTube still. Mobile or desktop? Mobile. Website or app? Oh, blah, golly, I, I guess app, but webs I don't know, app. Paid search or SEO? Uh, that one I'll have to say both. Outreach or advertise? Outreach. 
Email to one or email to many? Email to many as if you were emailing to one. Social subscriber or email subscriber? Mm, social probably these days. And local marketing or global marketing? Global. But it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I got the final button in before you said it depends. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. It's, uh, you, you could almost say it depends with then uh, everything there. But with it's, it's, every it's, single one of those, that's right. Yeah, that's it's right. nice to see what your initial reaction is because that possibly tells a story as well. You were having a bit of an internal battle with yourself with, between websites and an app, though. Why was that? Uh, well, it depends. It depends on what you're talking about when you say app. You know, I mean, if if you're a company needing to present something, you still have to have a website. Everybody's got to have one of those. Okay, so then what do you mean by app? Well, exactly. And there's progressive web apps um, coming that are uh, more companies are embracing. It's not necessarily going go, going to be essential for people to be downloading apps in the future or, or to be able to get that app type experience as well. So I guess the definition well, of an app is changing as well. Yeah, and, and I agree with you on one front. Your web should be more like an app than a website. It should be interactive. It should be a place where people come to do something. Mm. And so, yes, should the real question is, should all websites be more like apps? And the answer is, of course. Yeah, and websites should be fast uh, to use as well, of course, as well. The, the challenge with making something a little bit more interactive is it can slow things down a little bit there as well. Are you a fan of um, AMP pages? Um, tell me what you mean by that. Um, accelerated mobile pages by Google. So oh, right, um, right, right. their their yeah. version of um, mobile uh, of of web pages that are designed to load a lot more quickly. Yes, yeah. yes, obviously. There, Google cares a lot about speed, and you'll rank higher if you're you'll rank lower if you're slower. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, certainly an important part of the algorithm that, again, many websites don't pay as much attention to as they should do. Yeah. But um, let us move on to... The $10,000 question. If I was to give you $10,000 and you had to spend it over the next few days on a single thing to, go, to grow your business, what would you spend it on and how would you measure success? <laughs> Oh golly, this is this is really a, a uh, ask a general question can't give you a general answer. It really does depend, and this is one of when you asked me earlier today with the biggest problem with marketing. I probably should have said that everybody's trying to apply cookie cutter um, techniques to their specific situation, and their situation is different than everyone else's. Everything about it is different, so. I'd really have to say, okay, the first thing I would do with that $10,000 is find out what my market needs and what my competitors are doing, which you can do now. You can see exactly what they're doing and spend the money understanding that before I spent any more money. <laughs> that's what I would do with the money. That's that, that's a decent answer. and I appreciate that. I think um, I don't think I've had that answer before either, but I, I, I can understand exactly where you're coming from. You know, there's no point in throwing money at something unless I guess you know precisely the market and what is likely to work f for that particular market. Yeah, yeah, isn't that what it's all about? Because if it doesn't work, I mean, what's the point, right? Yeah, absolutely. My number yeah. one takeaway. So um, you've offered a lot of great advice in a conversation, Kristen, but what is the number one takeaway? What's the single most important step that a listener just needs to take away and implement in their business? You can't sell to people you don't know. If you don't know your customer, really know your customer as well as you know your best friend or, or your family, you're not going to be able to sell to them. They're going to look at your stuff and say, they're not talking to me. They don't know me. They don't know what I want. And they just leave. That's what happens. So that's, that's the big takeaway. Anything, any guessing is, oh, it's fatal. It's so expensive. It's just... It's it's guaranteed failure. Guessing is guaranteed failure. Great advice. Well, that takes us to the end of our discussion today. So thank you so much for your time and your advice. Thank you. What's the best way to, um, for a listener to find out more about you, though, and, and what you do? They can go to JivagoPartners.com. They can see me on LinkedIn. Uh, the book is on Amazon, of course, Roadmap to Revenue. Um, you can just type that in. You get it. Um, that's Those are the best ways. 
Lovely. Okay, and again, I'll link to those resources in the show notes at digitalmarketingradio.com. So, uh, thank you to Kristen, and thank you, dear listener, too. If you have an opinion of what Kristen shared today, tell us what you think. So, the Facebook page is facebook.com slash digitalmarketingradio. You can tweet me, at David Bain. Plus, remember to subscribe to the podcast if you're not already. So, you can do that at digitalmarketingradio.com slash iTunes for iPhones, or digitalmarketingradio.com slash Android for Android devices. But until we meet again, be fantabulous and do one thing that scares you. Adios.